Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. But you know, alibiers, welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here as we continue on this crash course to get ready for Lori Vallow's trial, which is in 13 days, by the way, 12 days till I hop a plane to Boise. So music fact of the day real quick on the VH1 show, True Spin, Duran Duran explained that their song Rio is actually a metaphor for America. And the song expressed their desire to succeed here, which they did. Love Duran Duran. All right. We left off with Alex's police station interview. So we are going to hop right into Lori's, but we are remembering Charles Vallow, a life taken too soon by some evil, evil people. And Lori says that Charles got the house for her that they were living in and that he was murdered in. Now she martyrs herself and makes her out to be, you know, to be a saint. And she says, JJ is Charles's biological great nephew and calls JJ a drug baby. Lori says that Charles had come to bring her some things when she first moved back to Houston. And she said he was making all these threats. She said it was on her phone. And when asked about the threats, Lori told the detective he would just need to see them. She said Charles was always mad at her that uh, he didn't want a divorce, but she didn't like him and didn't want to deal with him. So she points to the room where Tylee is in the police station, which is right next door, and says Charles had always been horrible to her. That's hogwash. She said Charles and Tylee always got into big, huge fights. She said Charles told her all of a sudden that he was coming into town to see JJ that Wednesday. She said she never kept JJ from him and he could take him to school whenever he wanted. She said when Charles moved them to Texas, J.J. didn't have anything, didn't have any of his services, have any stability. He was ripped out of school. And Lori says she didn't go with them at first. Lori forgets to mention she was gone for over 70 something days without contacting J.J. She said Charles took J.J. and she let him and didn't file anything in the courts. She said Charles filed something saying that she would only have supervised visits because she's crazy. She said she didn't talk to him for 30 days and let him take care of JJ to let him see what she had been doing for the past seven years. She said Charles was begging her to pick JJ up. What a lie. That is not true. Lori mentions that, that she has other kids and grandkids. She said that her and Tylee eventually left everything and moved to Houston. She also mentions that Charles traveled for work and suddenly said he was coming to see JJ and that was fine, but he couldn't stay at the house because he couldn't get along with Tylee. So she said she would book him a hotel. She said that Charles's job requires travel so he doesn't have to stay home and take care of a special needs child. You know, and, and you do see the resentment, deep seated resentment that Lori had for JJ to me in this interview, drug child. She, he doesn't have to take care of a special needs child, that kind of thing. You know, I think for, for Lori, JJ was a guarantee that when this marriage went south, that she would at least get benefits and child support for JJ. It was a money thing for her, I think. And uh, she blames Charles, saying that JJ had been a nightmare and he was acting that way because Charles had ripped JJ from his routine, saying that Charles only thinks of himself. By the way, if you're on YouTube, here's a picture of her during this interview, just smiling happy. But it's interesting because she's gaslighting here. Charles only thinks of himself. He ripped JJ from his routine. JJ's routine was his mom and Tylee. When all this went down, that was the total opposite. Now she goes on to lie and says that JJ freaks out when he knows his dad is coming because he associates Charles with Houston. So she said she didn't tell JJ he was coming. She said Charles did not bother her the night before. And that was surprising because she was expecting, quote, kind of an ambush and he would come over and just be mean. Wow. Yes, yeah, somebody got ambushed. It wasn't you, girl. She said she expected him to say his name was on the lease and he could stay if he wanted to. And she called it his macho attitude that she expected to see. She said she heard from Charles the night before when he said he would be there at 730 to pick up JJ. 
She said he was banging on the door that morning and she tried to be nice and had JJ's school stuff ready. Lori said he was supposed to be there at 730, but not arriving until 740. And that usually he was punctual. We know from the timeline that the last time he talked to Adam was 735. So she's wrong there. Lori says JJ acknowledged Charles and ran to her saying he wasn't taking him to school. She said she told JJ it was okay and daddy could drive him. And she said she was just trying to say things to keep him calm. She said Charles was being smirky and jerky to her, so she was ignoring him. When asked if Alex lived there, she said no, but he stayed because Lori was worried Charles may come over and cause trouble, so she wanted Alex there because she trusts him. Discrepancy, because we know Alex says, no, she didn't ask me to stay. We were going to go have fun that day. She said it's a long story, but she had to go live at Alex's house when Charles took JJ and that he's been difficult. Charles said they were leaving in 20 minutes, but Lori said you can't go this early because the school gates don't open until 820. She told him to leave with JJ now because she didn't want to get him there and suggested that he take JJ to Burger King and get breakfast. And she said JJ was very particular about what he would eat in the morning and it was chicken fries and Sprite. I feel you, little dude. Some chicken fries would be good right now. Lori said Charles agreed to leave, so she gave him JJ's backpack and they got in the car. She said Charles always leaves something in the house and never leaves the first time. And she said he came back in because he had left his phone on the counter. And when he came back in, Lori had the phone. But, you know, here's the thing that I wonder. I don't know if they ever canvassed the neighborhood to see if any of the neighbors had ring cams. I mean, this was a very nice neighborhood. It, it's not out of the realm of possibility that some people might have some kind of surveillance. I want to know, did he go to the car and go back in? And why would he leave his phone on the counter? It makes no sense. I, I really, I mean, all this is hogwash as we know, but still. Charles asked for his phone and Lori said, why don't you show me the text you've been texting? Which I'm assuming she means to Adam because at this point we know her sister and her mom have let her know that they're going to have this intervention because she's 50 shades of cray. Lori said he had been acting weird like he was plotting something and she asks why he's in town and then he says she knows he's been talking to Adam who came in town, town at the same time. Lori said she doesn't talk to Adam and was questioning Charles when and if they had talked. She said Charles had been threatening her, saying you're going down and blaming her for the breakup and other marriages around them, calling her a destroyer of families. She says Charles goes nuts, saying he, he had only gone nuts bef before and she and JJ and Tylee have, ha have had to leave five times over the years and they've had to stay at a hotel because he's had these moments. She says going nuts is yelling and screaming with pushing and grabbing, but not hitting. She goes back to the morning of the murder and said he was worried about her seeing whatever was on the phone. She said he was holding the phone. She was holding the phone and Charles was screaming at her. She said Tylee came out of her room with a bat and said, leave my mother alone. Charles told her not to hit him with the bat. And she said Alex comes out and she doesn't know if Tylee tried to hit Charles or not. But Charles grabbed the bat and went to hit her with it. She said Alex grabbed him from behind to stop him, and then they started grappling. And Charles is hitting Alex with the bat while they're on the ground, which makes zero sense. But Lori's swinging her hand downward and saying that Charles was hitting Alex with the bat. How are you swinging the bat like a chopping motion if you're grappling on the ground? The best you can do is try to maybe whack him on the side of the head. Lori says she's freaking out and tries to go around knowing JJ was in the car. She said Charles gets up and has the bat towards her and motions as if Charles is swinging backhanded because, you know, you're really going to hurt somebody if they walk by while you're swinging it backhanded. What a moron. Lori said she's trying to go around in a way not to get hit. And she said Tylee fell back when Charles grabbed the bat. She told Tylee to go to the car with JJ because she didn't want JJ coming in and didn't want the kids in the house for, quote, whatever this fight was going to be, end quote. She said Alex got up, but see, here's the thing too. She says that she tried to get around knowing JJ was in the car, but then she says she told Tylee to go to the car with JJ because she didn't want JJ coming in and didn't want kids in the house for whatever fight this was going to be. She said Alex got up and Charles came at her with the bat yelling for her to give him his phone back. 
She said when she went around the kitchen to get away from him and came back around, she heard the shot and saw Charles laying on the ground. She was supposed to be outside, according to Alex. So discrepancy. The report says Lori said she was kind of turned around and they all, the three, the kids were outside and she heard the gunshot. So according to Lori, her, Alex and Charles were in the house when he got shot. Lori said she freaked out and went into mom mode and got JJ to school. She went outside to see if they were okay and she didn't want them coming inside. She said JJ was trying to get back inside the house and Tylee had crazy eyes looking at her like what happened. They got in the car and left. Now, here's the thing. If JJ was so worried his dad was going to take him back to Houston, why would JJ be trying to get back inside the house? Would he not be glad he was in the car with his dad with, without his dad, according to Lori? So when asked where Alex was after the shot, she said he was in front of Charles and it all happened so quickly. She said after the shooting, Alex didn't say anything to her because they were in shock. She said she went to check on the kids and was going back in, but maybe she didn't. How are you going to not know if you came back in or not? There's a body on the floor, and it's a traumatic thing. You would know if you came back in. Lori said she needed to get JJ to school, call the police, and get back. Lori said Alex called her and asked if she was taking JJ to school, and she said yes and told him they needed to call the police, and Alex said okay. So, as we know from the previous episode, he denied calling Lori. The investigator clarified that Alex called her when she didn't come back inside. She said she was in the car probably for a minute, freaking out, wondering what to do. Probably what she was actually doing was coaching Tylee. Lori says that Tylee was also freaking out, so she just decided to take JJ to school. When asked at what point Alex had the gun, she said she didn't know. She said she didn't see Alex leave the room, but it all happened so fast. And she said he's a gun person and he always has guns and he's professional with guns. She said she didn't hear anything prior to hearing the shot between Alex and Charles. When asked if there was anything else, she didn't say that she wanted to. She said Charles was so angry, super scary, and he acted like a teenager when you take their phone. She said she thought he would hit her with the bat to get the phone. When asked if she thought Charles would hurt, hurt her or Tylee, she said absolutely, but he would never hurt JJ, but she said he did hurt Alex with his little boo-boo on the back of his head. The detective said he was going to speak to, um, she was going to speak to Tylee and another detective was speaking to Alex. When asked if she needed to call anyone, she said she didn't know what she would say. The detective explained victim services to her, 30 minutes in y'all, victim services, Lori said Tylee had been through so much over the years. Yeah, because of you. When the detective inquired about JJ, Lori said he was used to Charles not being there and wouldn't understand if you told him that Charles had died. But our next partner is Athletic Greens. I take AG1 by Athletic Greens literally every day. I gave AG1 a try because I'm always busy and my diet isn't the best, but I still want to get all the vitamins my body needs without taking a ton of pills. I take AG1 in the morning before my first cup of coffee and it makes me feel ready to take on my day. Why take a bunch of different things when you can just mix one scoop of powder in water once a day? It's the healthiest thing you can do in under a minute. With one scoop, I'm getting 75 vitamins and minerals that help my mood, energy levels, and healthier hair, skin, and nails. It's delivered to me every month, and it's been the easiest way to arm my body with everything it needs to tackle my day. If you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash what the world. That's athleticgreens.com slash what the world. Check it out. You know your girl's been lacking in the sleep department lately, but I found something that helps me sleep much better when I do sleep. Who knew that a better pillowcase is all you need for better sleep? Let's talk about practicing self-care while you sleep. Set yourself up with better sleep this year with Blissey's award-winning 100% mulberry silk pillowcases. It gives you better hair and skin. Seriously, silk, it's what's best for your hair and skin. It reduces frizz, tangles, and prevents breakage. That's because it keeps the moisture in your hair and your skincare products and natural moisture on your skin, unlike cotton does. 
You can say goodbye to wrinkly, dry, flaky skin in the morning and wake up with healthier and shinier hair that won't take you an hour to fix. Blissey's pillowcase regulates temperatures, keeping you cool at night. You don't have to flip the pillow anymore, thank goodness. Unlike other silk pillowcases, these are the highest quality silk. And guess what? They're machine washable and durable. Valentine's Day is coming up, so why not give the gift a better sleep? Plus, it comes in gift-ready packaging they'll be sure to love. I love that the pillow stays cool, I don't have to flip it, and no more sleep lines. Everybody loves them. They have a ton of different prints and colors, and they make great gifts because there's an option for literally anyone. Hey, men, they love them too. They have over 1 million raving fans, and you need to be next. Try now, risk-free, for 60 nights at blissy.com slash whattheworld. Get an additional 30% off. That's blissy, B-L-I-S-S-Y dot com slash whattheworld. And use code whattheworld to get 30% off. Your skin and your hair will thank you. At school, later on, JJ told his teachers that Charles wasn't in heaven. He was just at work. So... You know, the differences between Lori and Tylee are so big as far as how they reacted to being in this interrogation room. And Tylee was so pained. And I'm going to tell you right now what really bothers me. This poor, this poor girl, gosh, less than two months later, Tylee has a moment where she starts getting emotional while she's waiting. She had to wait 32 minutes, by the way, for the investigator to come in. That's a long time for a 16 year old who just went through all that and has been probably told God knows what, if you don't go by our version, she starts to cry. She's very fidgety. She stretches her arms, cracks her back, cracks her knuckles. And you see how quickly when she gets emotional, she just stops it. And, you know, I thought to myself the first time I saw this police video, that kid is probably so used to not being able to show emotion. If you remember, her aunt, Annie Cushing, said that when she came to visit Tylee after Joe Ryan died, she was actually, that Tylee was being encouraged not to mourn the loss of her father. It was just so sad to see how quickly she cut it off. But you can see here the pain on her face. And here's the thing. Step parents, step step kids. It's it's a hard situation sometimes, and maybe they did argue. That's normal stuff. But at the end of the day, Tylee probably knew deep down that Charles loved her and took care of her, and that was likely the most stable time in her entire life was when Lori was happily married to Charles because it was like a real family. And man. You just see it in that poor little face. So the investigator comes in and says, hi. Tally says hi back and smiles. And so they have Tally spell her name. And they, uh, the investigator said that they were taking guesses on how she spelt her name. So the investigator said, I know this is going to sound like a silly question because it's really broad. But can you basically tell me what happened today? And Tally nods, yes. And the investigator said, just start wherever it makes sense for you. And I might ask you questions. So Tylee said she woke up around 7.50 because I heard yelling from right outside my door. She said, I don't even know what I heard, but I immediately jumped up and I have a baseball bat because when I was living at my Uncle Alex's by myself, I just wanted something to feel safer. And I'm not old enough to get pepper spray or anything. The investigator says, so right outside your bedroom door. She says, I didn't go inside your house, so I'm at a bit of a disadvantage. Where does your bedroom door open to? It just, it blows my mind that they didn't go inside the house, at least, because how are you going to know the layout and where things went down? You've got a diagram by Alex, but you don't have one by Tylee or Lori, and clearly you don't have any footage from inside that house yet. But she said that she kind of hand gestures to where every room is. And she said, there's a little hallway and then everything happened in the big room. She says right now it has mirrors up because my mom wanted a dance room. And she says, it's kind of unconventional, but she said she immediately jumped up and grabbed her bat, opened the door. And it's my stepdad, you know, outside the doorway and my uncle kind of in the doorway. And I could hear my mom behind him. And he was just screaming at both of them. Like, I don't even know what he was saying because honestly it was just, I was just too wired, I guess. So I told him to take a few steps back 
and he didn't like me telling him what to do. So I stood there. Then my uncle kind of moved out of the way and my mom went past him into the big room where everything happened. So I walked with them. The investigator said, so they were more in the hallway and Tylee said, yeah, they were at the end of the hallway and my mom walked all the way around and I kind of followed them and I stood, she's using hand gestures and said, Charles and Alex were essentially face to face. And she said her and Lori were off to the side. Now, remember, Alex said when all this went down, Lori had already left with the kids. Tylee did see the confrontation. I didn't do anything with the baseball bat. I just kind of held it there. Remember, Alex says she kind of uh, poked him in the chest. But Tylee said, I kind of stuck it between them and they were both yelling. And Charles was like, if you hit me with that baseball bat, you're going to go to jail. And I just kind of stood there with the baseball bat. I really didn't say anything. So the investigator asked who was yelling. And she said it was mostly my stepdad. He was really the only one yelling. My mom was kind of responding, but I honestly couldn't tell you what they were saying. It's kind of all jumbled up in my head. So I just kind of stuck the bat out there and he just grabbed it and tried to take it. So I held on to the end and I fell and he kind of just took it in his hands like he was going to do something with it. And the investigator says, so when you fell, he ended up with the bat and Tylee says, yes. So I fall to the ground and my uncle I saw him take a step back and my uncle, I think, kind of grabbed him, took him back so he couldn't do anything. And my mom said to go with JJ. So I ran out the door and I just kind of stood there with my little brother. He was in the front seat of the car. So I opened the door and stood there. He was trying to get out and I was like, no, we have to stay in. I asked him if he wanted to go in the Jeep and he said no. And then I realized my car was blocked in so I couldn't anyways. So I told him to stay here, and eventually my mom came out, and we left from there. The investigator asked, do you know what happened inside the house? Did she explain it all to you? Tally says, I just kind of asked her because I heard a noise, which I know now what it was, but it sounded like someone took the baseball bat and hit it really hard on the floor. And I wanted to make sure my stepdad didn't do anything to my uncle. And Lori was like, Al's fine, but we're just going to take JJ to school. And we went to Burger King because JJ wanted breakfast. The investigators say, so let's back up. And you said you put the bat out because your stepdad was coming at your mom. Can you describe to me a little bit better what was going on there? Is, that, is there a reason you put the bat up? Tylee said he was walking towards my mom and I didn't want him to do anything. So I just stuck the bat out. My mom was right beside me, so it's not like I put the bat between them. I just stuck it out to be like, keep your distance. The investigator said, when you said you didn't want him to do anything, what did you think he was going to do? And Tylee said, hit her. She said, for the most part, it's been pretty mundane, but there have been a few violent times with him when she was scared he was going to hit her or Lori just because everything was kind of crazy. She said, me and him have always kind of not gotten along just since I was little. And there's been a few times we've gotten in fights and stuff like that. So I'm always scared of that. Investigator says, okay, so what happened? He grabbed the bat from you. Tell me about that again. Tylee said, I kind of stuck it out. And this is when he says, if you hit me with that, you're going to jail. I didn't say anything because I'm like, okay. And I'm holding the bat and he took it and I kind of lunged forward and lost my footing. And my mom was like, just let go. So I kind of slipped and fell on my side. At that point, my mom said, go to the car. So I just ran out the door. The investigator said, did you, when you fell, did you see what he was doing with the bat? Tylee said, no, I wasn't looking because where I fell, the door was in my line of vision. The investigator says he was in a different line of vision. And Tylee says, yes. The investigator says, so you see him take a step back. And from what you're saying and telling me if I'm wrong is that you didn't necessarily see your uncle pull him back. And Tylee says, yeah, it seems like he wouldn't have taken a step back on his own. So it's more of an assumption than anything. I didn't physically see him pull him back. The investigator says, does that make sense based on where your uncle was at the time? And Tylee said, yeah, he was behind him because he was he was on the other side with me and my mom. She said that's the order everyone walked out. So the investigator said, so when your mom told you to go, did you see what happened with your stepdad and your uncle? And Tylee says, no. So the investigator says, so once you went outside, you never went back inside. And Tylee pauses. She looks up 
at the ceiling and says, I went inside to get my mom's purse so we could have her wallet. But this was all happening in the bigger room. I went through the garage door and then there's a little hallway and this is the room where everything is happening. And this is my mom's room. And when I went in, I kind of just tuned everything out, ran to my mom's closet and ran out. So I didn't see or hear anything. So this would have been after the murder. She would have had to have run past him because the garage, I believe, is if you're looking on YouTube, the where the black box is, that hall there is the... I believe that's where the garage comes in. She would have had to run across and possibly would have seen Charles's Charles laying there. So the investigator said, when, when did you go back in to get your mom's purse? And Tylee said, after my mom came out. So the investigator said, after you heard the loud noise and Tylee says, yes, the investigator said, so when you heard the loud noise, was your mom inside or outside? And Tylee's cracking her knuckles and says, um, she looks off in the distance and says she's trying to think. She said, I think my mom was inside and the door opened immediately after it happened. It wasn't a long period of time. I remember not thinking about it for that long because if my mom hadn't come out, I would have been thinking about it for a lot longer than I had. The investigator says, I don't know your mom, your stepdad, or your uncle. So can you tell me where the three of them were at emotionally and how they were behaving when all this was happening when you came out of your room. Tylee says, so my stepdad, he was like, I don't even know how to explain it. He honestly just looked like a crazy person. He was screaming and his face was beat red and he just looked really mad. I remember he took the bat from me. I saw the look on his face for a split second and honestly, he didn't look like himself. So much rage. I hadn't seen him all the way like that before. It's the craziest I've ever seen him. My uncle was kind of calm, not super calm. Obviously, it was a stressful situation. He was standing in the doorway kind of being protective of my mom, but he wasn't yelling or saying anything. But then he says he was he was yelling and my mom was just kind of talking. I think she means Charles there. The investigator says, so you don't remember what your mom was saying or what he was mad about? Tylee says, not really. No, I'm sorry. So I think it's interesting that both Alex and Tylee, neither one said they knew what the argument was about. The investigator said, that's okay. We're talking about something that took place in two seconds. And Tylee said, yeah, honestly, it felt like two seconds and 40 minutes at the same time. I just heard yelling over everything. I do that when things are loud. I just tune out. Yelling isn't fun for a kid to hear. With my biological dad, I always heard him screaming. So I just turned it out, tuned it out. The investigator asked, so when you woke up and heard yelling, but didn't know what was being said, did you know who was yelling? Tylee said, yeah, my stepdad. He said, well, at first, you know, when you first wake up, you're disoriented. Then I remember my stepdad was coming to take my little brother to school today. So I immediately knew it was him. And then my uncle, I knew he was staying. So I knew that was him. And then my mom, I knew that was her. So the investigator said, you went out of your room and took your bat out. Is there a reason you took the bat out with you? Tally said it was first instinct. Obviously, I didn't hit him with the bat or anything like that. It was just kind of for security, I guess, to know that I had it. In hindsight, I shouldn't have brought it out at all because it caused more trouble. It was first instinct, and it was right by my bed, so I jumped up and grabbed it. The investigator said, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, so there was something in particular you were concerned about to take the bat with you. Tally says, only if he had been violent towards me or my mom, it wasn't like I'm going to take the bat and do something. I needed something in my hand to feel safer. The investigator says, my second question, is there anything we didn't talk about that you think is important? Tally says, that was pretty much it. She says, I talked to your mom about victim services and says, I want your mom to talk to them and have extra support if you need anything. You know, Lori did not get that child help. Um, she says, I'm going to check in with your mom real quick. And that way you can meet her back before I take you back. She leaves Tylee again for around 30 minutes and Tylee sits. She lays her head down. She puts her hand over her eyes with her head down. The lady comes in and says that she would take her to her mom. So after the police interviews, they are driven home by a deputy. The crime scene was still being processed. And so they leave. Detective Moffat noted, I drove Alex, Lori, and Tally back to the residence on Four Peaks so they could get a vehicle to go somewhere while the scene was being processed. 
During the ride back to the residence, there was no further discussion about this incident. In the van ride, there was informal conversation by mainly Lori. The conversation between Lori was lighthearted and seemed odd in light of the events of the day. Alex, Lori, and Tylee left the residence, and I remained on scene at the residence while the scene was completed. So at 2 p.m., they try to call Lori and Alex on their phones to ask if they could come back to the house, but they didn't answer. The investigator left voicemails. They arrived back at the house while investigators were still there, and Alex uh, stays with investigators, and Lori asked to leave with Tylee to pick up JJ from school. Now, much later, December 5th, 2019, we are right in the thick of it. In an email exchange between investigators, statement it says, statements made by Lori, Alex, and Tylee were later found to be inconsistent with evidence found in the investigation. So let's look at discrepancies. Lori said when asked if Alex lived there, she said nobody stayed because Lori was worried Charles may come over and cause trouble. So she wanted Alex there because she trusts him. Now, the investigator, as we know, asked Alex, did your sister ever express concerns for her safety with Charles coming there? He says, no, but watching her interact with him, I was. Alex said he stayed the night because they were planning to do something, a fun day. They hadn't really decided what yet. He was going to take her to the shooting range or take JJ to a water park, a movie or something. Towards the end of the interview, when asked if there was a reason he spent the night there last night, Alex said, no, not really. We were going to hang out there today. Again, the investigator asked, so she never said anything about having you come over because she didn't feel safe with him showing up. And Alex says a very loud no. Tylee about the bat. I didn't do anything with the baseball bat. I just kind of held it there and I stuck it out between them and they were both yelling. So I kind of stuck the baseball bat out there and he grabbed it. And tried to take it, so I held on to the end and I fell. He just kind of took it in his hands like he was going to do something with it. Tylee said he was walking towards my mom and I didn't want him to do anything, so I stuck the bat out. Lori says she doesn't know if Ty Tylee tried to hit Charles or not, but Charles grabbed the bat and tried to hit her, meaning Lori, with it. Now, Alex about the bat. Tylee came out with her bat. I had separated them for a minute. He made it sound like they were all up in each other's faces. My sister walks around me to go to the living room. Charles was following Lori, yelling. Tylee told him to get back. She took her bat and shoved him, and he took the bat away. Later, Alex says, so he backed up. I cleared the doorway, so she came around, talking about Lori, and Charles was behind her, pursuing her aggressively, so Tylee came out and yelled at him with the bat. And then Tylee says she followed them into the main room. Now, on Alex pushing Charles. Alex says, she came in my room. I pushed him down. The investigator asked, did he get back up? Yes. Later, the investigator asked, did he get back up? I think so. The investigator says, you pushed Charles back. He probably fell to the ground or did fall to the ground. And Alex says he stumbled back. So three different right there. All right, about getting hit with the bat. Lori said they were on the ground grappling and Charles was hitting him and she motions up and down with her hands. Alex said he shoved Tylee, took the bat away, then he just hit me. I went down. Another version from Alex, there was shoving first, and I got spun around, and he popped me. The third version, I grabbed him from behind and went to the ground. He hit me. I went to get my gun. Version number four, Alex says I grabbed him from the back. We went to the ground. Alex didn't see him swing the bat at him. Alex says, if we go to the ground, I get up. He hits me in the head, so I don't know if it was with the bat or not. I assume it was. He had it. Alex says, I was getting up and my head bounced. So he had this going in 50 different directions. All right, let's keep going on these discrepancies. Where were Lori and Tylee during the shooting? Alex didn't see him, weren't in the house. Lori, or her, Charles, and Alex, we were all in the living room except for the kids. I heard the gunshot. Lori says, I was in the kitchen and went around to get away from Charles and heard the shot. Lori said, when she came back in the room, Alex was in front of Charles and they didn't speak. They were in shock. The investigator asked Alex, did you see Lori and Tylee again after the shooting? Alex says, no. According to Tylee, I went inside to get my mom's purse. I just turned, tuned everything out and ran to my mom's closet. There's no way he missed her if she came in that house. And Lori was in the house. 
on the 911 call. Dispatch, how long ago did this happen? Actually, 8.36 a.m. was the time of that call. Alex, said a couple of minutes ago, at 8.49 a.m., Lori leaves the house. That's over 40 minutes after the shooting that 911 is called. So the call, Lori said she needed to get JJ to school, call the police and get back. The investigator asked if they talked about calling 911. Lori said Alex called her and asked if she was taking him to school. She said yes and said, we need to call the police. Alex says, okay. The investigator asked Alex, when did you realize Lori had gone? Did you call her? No. You know, a simple search warrant of their phones would have shown discrepancies. Yeah. I mean, and, and the other thing, too, that's a big discrepancy is Alex claims that he shot Charles twice while he was standing, but there is a downward strike in that baseboard that they found when they rolled Charles over. Why they didn't bring these people back to re-interview them even a day or two later once they all get their notes together and realize there are some big discrepancies is beyond me, y'all. I don't understand it. Uh, this was deemed self-defense until the kids were missing when they reopened it. And gosh knows what in the world could have been avoided had some investigation been done into all of this. It is just, it's just terrible. At four o'clock, Lori calls Colby and tells him that Charles had a heart attack and died. She told him Charles had become frustrated and died. She indicated Tylee was there when he died, and it worried Colby that Tylee saw Charles die. So at 7 o'clock, Colby says he goes over to the house, which was his first time being at that particular house. Tylee met him at the door and immediately hugged him and started crying. Colby noticed a bandage on Alex's head and asked what happens. So Alex tells Colby that him and Charles got into a fight, and so he shot and killed him, which is totally different from Lori's story of a heart attack because he got frustrated right Colby goes outside to talk to Lori cusses her out and says she never gave any explanation of why she told him Charles had a heart attack Colby said he didn't want to be there but they went inside and sat around the kitchen table Colby said Lori Tylee and Alex all started to tell him what happened when told Tylee got a bat Colby told investigators that wouldn't have been out of character for her I just think if you look at these photos of the difference in body language, Tylee is sad. Tylee is just a hot mess and she has to stifle it. And Lori, if you look in the bottom, she wiping her eyes. But what's she doing? She's looking up at the camera because she knows they're watching. Oh, Lord. And I just think this picture right here of Charles, I don't, you know, somebody sent me this a couple of years ago. Look at this guy. First of all, handsome dude. And he's got like three birds. One of them's on his hand. He's got like a dog on his lap, dog between his legs. And you can kind of understand what kind of man he is. Probably just a fun loving guy that really got it. And then I think about this poor, poor baby right here. Less than two months later, she would be brutally murdered and unspeakable things done to her body by these monsters. So hiding for them. They didn't appreciate it, did they? All right, guys, I will see you tomorrow. We'll keep going. Things are going to go a little faster from here, uh, but we're going to take as long as we need to take to get through these. They're very important to get you ready for trial because I'll be bringing you a recap every night of the testimony. So share it with your friends if they are interested and share it with people who don't know anything about the case. A lot of people are like, when you try to explain this case to somebody and is you almost see smoke coming out of their ears because there's so many people and then the crazy stuff they believe and all that stuff. It, it's it's just so convoluted. It is it is it's probably the craziest case I've ever heard. And that's saying even from Murdoch. I, I have to say this one takes the cake of any case I've ever covered, unfortunately. But all right, guys, we'll see you soon.